English listening. Topic 1. Sport Shop Now we go to Jane, who is going to tell us about what's happening in town this weekend. Right, thanks Andrew. And now on to what's new. And do we really need yet another sports shop in Bradcaster? Well, most of you probably know Sports World, the branch of a Danish sports goods company that opened a few years ago. It's attracted a lot of custom, and so the company has now decided to open another branch in the area. It's going to be in the shopping centre to the west of Bradcaster. So that will be good news for all of you who found the original shop in the north of the town hard to get to. I was invited to a special preview, and I can promise you, this is the ultimate in sports retailing. The whole place has been given a new minimalist look with the company's signature colours of black and red. The first three floors have a huge range of sports clothing as well as equipment, and on the top floor there's a cafe and a book and DVD section. You'll find all the well-known names, as well as some less well-known ones. If they haven't got exactly what you want in stock, they promise to get it for you in 10 days, unlike the other store, where it can take up to 14 days. They cover all the major sports, including football, tennis and swimming, but they particularly focus on running, and they claim to have the widest range of equipment in the country. As well as that, a whole section of the third floor is devoted to sports bags, including the latest designs from the States. If you can't find what you want here, it doesn't exist. The shop will be open from 9am this Saturday, and if you go along to the opening, then you'll have the chance to meet the national 400 metres running champion, Paul King, who's coming along to open the shop. And he will be staying around until about midday to chat to any fans who want to meet him and sign autographs. Then there will be a whole range of special attractions all weekend. There will be free tickets for local sporting events for the first 50 customers, and also a special competition open to all. Just answer 15 out of 20 sports questions correctly to win a signed copy of Paul King's DVD, Spring Tips, while the first person to get all the questions correct gets a year's free membership of the Bradcaster Gym. All entrants will receive a special sports calendar with details of all Bradcaster fixtures in the coming year. One of the special opening offers is a fitness test, a complete review of your cardiac fitness and muscle tone, actually done in the shop by qualified staff. This would normally cost £30, but is available at half price for this month only. There are only a limited number of places available for this, so to make a booking, phone 560-341. In addition, if you open an account, you get lots more special offers, including the chance to try out equipment at special opening. Topic 2. Mass Strandings Good afternoon, everyone. Well, with some of you about to go out on field work, it's timely that in this afternoon's session I'll be sharing some ideas about the reasons why groups of whales and dolphins sometimes swim ashore from the sea right onto the beach and, most often, die in what are known as mass strandings. Unfortunately, this type of event is a frequent occurrence in some of the locations that you'll be travelling to, where sometimes the tide goes out suddenly, confusing the animals. However, there are many other theories about the causes of mass strandings. The first is that the behaviour is linked to parasites. It's often found that stranded animals were infested with large numbers of parasites. For instance, a type of worm is commonly found in the ears of dead whales. Since marine animals rely heavily on their hearing to navigate, this type of infestation has the potential to be very harmful. 
Another theory is related to toxins or poisons. These have also been found to contribute to the death of many marine animals. Many toxins, as I'm sure you're aware, originate from plants or animals. The whale ingests these toxins in its normal feeding behavior, but whether these poisons directly or indirectly lead to stranding and death seems to depend upon the toxin involved. In 1988, for example, 14 humpback whales examined after stranding along the beaches of Cape Cod were found to have been poisoned after eating tuna that contained saxitoxin, the same toxin that can be fatal in humans. Alternatively, it has also been suggested that some animals strand accidentally by following their prey ashore in the confusion of the chase. In 1995, David Thurston monitored pilot whales that beached after following squid ashore. However, this idea does not seem to hold true for the majority of mass strandings because examination of the animal's stomach contents reveal that most had not been feeding as they stranded. There are also some new theories which link strandings to humans. A growing concern is that loud noises in the ocean cause strandings. Noises such as those caused by military exercises are of particular concern and have been pinpointed as the cause of some strandings of late. One of these, a mass stranding of whales in 2000 in the Bahamas, coincided closely with experiments using a new submarine detection system. There were several factors that made this stranding stand out as different from previous strandings. This led researchers to look for a new cause. For one, all the stranded animals were healthy. In addition, the animals were spread out along 38 kilometers of coast, whereas it's more common for the animals to be found in a group when mass strandings occur. A final theory is related to group behavior and suggests that sea mammals cannot distinguish between sick and healthy leaders and will follow sick leaders even to an inevitable death. This is a particularly interesting theory since the whales that are thought to be most social, the toothed whales, are the group that strand the most frequently. The theory is also supported by evidence from a dolphin stranding in 1994. Examination of the dead animals revealed that, apart from the leader, all the others had been healthy at the time of their death. Without one consistent theory, however, it is very hard for us to do anything about this phenomenon except to assist animals where and when we can. Stranding networks have been established around the world to aid in rescuing animals and collecting samples from those that could not be helped. I recommend John Connor's Marine Mammals Ashore as an excellent starting point if you're interested in finding out more about these networks or establishing one yourself. Topic 3. Wildlife Club Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to our Wildlife Club and very pleased that you're interested in the countryside and the plants and creatures of this area. I think you'll be surprised at the variety we have here, even though we're not far from London. I'll start by telling you about some of the parks and open spaces nearby. One very pleasant place is Halland Common. This has been public land for hundreds of years, and what you'll find interesting is that the River Ouse, which flows into the sea 80 kilometres away, has its source in the common. There's an information board about the plants and animals you can see here, and, by the way, the common is accessible 24 hours a day. Then there's Holt Island, which is noted for its great range of trees. In the past, willows were grown here commercially for basket making, and this ancient craft has recently been reintroduced. The island is only open to the public from Friday to Sunday because it's quite small, and if there were people around every day, much of the wildlife would keep away. 
From there, it's just a short walk across the bridge to Longfield Country Park. Longfield has a modern replica of a farm from over 2,000 years ago. Children's activities are often arranged there, like bread making and face painting. The park is only open during daylight hours, so bear that in mind if you decide to go there. Longfield Park has a programme of activities throughout the year, and to give you a sample, this is what's happening in the next few days. On Monday, you can learn about herbs and how they've been used over the centuries. You'll start with a tour of our herb garden, practice the technique of using them as colour dyes for cloth, and listen to an illustrated talk about their use in cooking and medicine. Then on Wednesday, you can join local experts to discover the variety of insects and birds that appear in the evening. We keep to a small number of people in the group, so if you want to go, you'll need to phone the park ranger a few days ahead. There's a small charge which you should pay when you turn up. I'm sure you're all keen to help with the practical task of looking after the park, so on Saturday you can join a working party. You'll have a choice of all sorts of activities, from planting hedges to picking up litter so you'll be able to change from one to another when you feel like it. The rangers will be hard at work all day, but do come and join in, even for just a short while. One thing, though, is to make sure you're wearing something that you don't mind getting dirty or torn. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our new wildlife area, Hinchingbrook Park, which will be opened to the public next month. This slide doesn't really indicate how big it is, but anyway, you can see the two gates into the park and the main paths. As you can see, there's a lake in the northwest of the park with a bird hide to the west of it at the end of a path. So it'll be a nice, quiet place for watching the birds on the lake. Fairly close to where refreshments are available, there's a dog walking area in the southern part of the park, leading off from the path. And if you just want to sit and relax, you can go to the flower garden. That's the circular area on the map, surrounded by paths. And finally, there's a wooded area in the western section of the park, between two paths. OK, that's enough from me, so let's get on. Topic 4. Company Cultures Good morning, everyone. Now, whether you're going to university to study business or some other subject, many of you will eventually end up working for a company of some kind. Now, when you first start working somewhere, you will realize that the organization you've joined has certain characteristics. And we often refer to these social characteristics as the culture of the organization. This includes its unwritten ideas, beliefs, values, and things like that. One well-known writer has classified company cultures by identifying four major types. The first type is called the power culture, and it's usually found in small organizations. It's the type of culture that needs a central source of power to be effective. And because control is in the hands of just one or two people, there aren't many rules or procedures. Another characteristic is that communication usually takes the form of conversations rather than, say, formal meetings or written memos. Now, one of the benefits of this culture is that the organization has the ability to act quickly, so it responds well to threat or danger on the one hand and opportunity on the other. But on the negative side, this type of organization doesn't always act effectively because it depends too much on one or two people at the top. And when these people make poor decisions, there's no one else who can influence them. And the kind of person who does well in this type of business culture is one who is happy to take risks and for whom job security is a low priority. 
The next type is known as role culture. That's R-O-L-E, not R-O-L-L, -L, by the way. And this type is usually found in large companies, which have lots of different levels in them. These organizations usually have separate departments that specialize in things like finance or sales or maintenance or whatever. Each one is coordinated at the top by a small group of senior managers, and typically everyone's job is controlled by sets of rules and procedures. For example, there are specific job descriptions, rules for discipline, and so on. What are the benefits of this kind of culture? Well, firstly, because it's found in large organizations, its fixed costs, or overheads as they're known, are low in relation to its output or what it produces. In other words, it can achieve economies of scale. And secondly, it is particularly successful in business markets where technical expertise is important. On the other hand, this culture is often very slow to recognize the need for change and even slower to react. What kind of person does this type of culture suit? Well, it suits employees who value security and who don't particularly want to have responsibility. Moving on now to task cultures. This type is found in organizations that are project-oriented. You usually find it where the market for the company's product is extremely competitive or where the products themselves have a short lifespan. Usually, top management delegates the projects, the people, and other resources. And once these have been allocated, little day-to-day -day control is exercised from the top, because this would seem like breaking the rules. Now, one of the major benefits of this culture is that it's flexible. But it does have some major disadvantages, too. For instance, it can't produce economies of scale or great depth of expertise. People who like working in groups or teams prefer this type of culture. And finally, the fourth category is called the person culture. This type is quite a team. Topic 5. Housing Designs Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. But at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects, and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun. And the walls 
had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future, the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds, which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything, environmentally I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco-housing like this is likely to become much more... Topic 6. Project on Wildlife Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, Two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city center gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, 
we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website, and of course any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase, rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have.